I don't know if you ever thought about it, but, you know, there, to, as the more I thought about Christianity, they realized that Christianity, there's something really subversive about the Christian faith. Something that, that kind of worms into anywhere that it goes and kind of reorients things, changes things. And some of those things are, are kind of, when you think about it, Christianity is subversive because it's oftentimes counterintuitive. In other words, it doesn't plot out like the way you think it would plot out. I mean, listen to the words of Jesus when he said, well, you want to be first? You want to be first? Well, get in the back of the line. Now, that's not what they normally tell you. You know, normally you fight your way to the front. Jesus goes, no, you want to be first? Get in the back of the line. You want to be great? You want to be considered important and, and, and influential with people? Then make them feel great. Jesus was counterintuitive when we did, and that's, that's subversive to the way oftentimes our culture is directing us. It's, it's scandalous, too. I mean, of all the faiths in the world, Christianity is the most scandalous faith because what it basically says is it doesn't matter what you do, what you've done, how horrendous it's been, when you come to the realization that what you've done has been against God and man, you can go to, to God and confess that, and he will wipe you clean. Now, he's not going to necessarily remove the consequences, but he will wipe that clean. Now, that's amazing. Most everybody else, you got to pay for it. you got to pay for the rest of eternity or work your way back up from being a cockroach to a human being or whatever it is to get all your karma back. But Christianity goes, no, that's not how it works. You can be completely forgiven, which is why people who have done horrendous things on death row can still be assured that they're going to be standing with God when that sentence is carried out. It's scandalous. And a lot of people don't like that. It seems radically unfair. And it's scandalous because in the end, Christianity doesn't really care a whit about your culture, doesn't really give a rip about your government, or what the intellectuals think is important. It says, no, this is what's true. It has a value system all of its own that oftentimes is really contrary to the value systems of the world that it finds itself in. And one of the reasons for it, it's scandalous, that it's scandalous, because it tells the truth. It holds the mirror up to you and I. First, it tells a personal truth. It tells us the truth about ourselves. And then it holds it up to the culture and says, this is what the truth is. And that's the reason why, because of all this stuff, that Christianity is scandalous to every, uh, any kind of dictator or despot, whoever wants to come and rule, because it, right away, the first thing they try to do is, is get rid of Bibles, get rid of Christianity, you know, isolate Christianity in some little thing, because it's dangerous to anybody that wants to rule and govern, especially with real thumbs down. Christianity has done that for 2,000 years. And it's dangerous to all the rulers of all ages, including our own. So we're looking at an incident this morning from Scripture that, on the face of it, I've actually heard people use this to, to you know, to say this is Jesus, how Jesus says we have to support the government that we're in and things like that. But what, what it really is, it's really an act of sedition. And I think you'll see this by the time we get done, but very quiet and subtle sedition, not just against the rulers at the time, but against the whole value system that, that many in the world even to this day hold. We're going to find this, uh, this intersection of powers, heavenly ones and earthly ones, in the book of Matthew, chapter 22, starting with verse 15. And it's something probably very familiar if you've ever driven your way through the Gospels, because it's in all three of, the, three of the four Gospels. But it's a really interesting look. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. Now, by the way, this was all taking place, when Tony spoke last week, this is all taking place, or Dane spoke last week. Who spoke last week? Dane. Yeah. When Dane spoke last week, um, it was all in the same, same context. We're, we're, we've come into Jerusalem, into the temple, and now guys are lining up to take pot shots at Jesus. So part of that same context. They were sort of waiting in line. Pharisees went out, laid a plan to trap him words. They sent their disciples to him along with Herodians. Herodians were guys who were sort of in bed with King Herod, who was in bed with the Romans. 
So they had guys on both political spectrums. They had the guys who were all about Israel coming back and being its own nation and running by its own rules. And then the Herodians were more than willing to kind of suckle um, from, from the Roman government. So you had both those camps, and they came together. They sent their disciples to him along with Herodians and said, Teacher, now listen to how they butter him up. We know that you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. So tell us then, what's your opinion? Is it right? And here it comes. Curveball. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Now, that was a really, really loaded question. Let me give you some clar clarifying about this incident. It, it, first of all, it was a really well set out trap. It was beautifully thought. They must have been working on this film for months. How do we get them in a no-win situation, you know? It, it, it'd be kind of it'd be kind of equivalent to, to, to me saying to Joe McAvoy, Joe, when did you stop beating Kelly? Okay? Or no, excuse me, Joe, do you stop, do you still beat Kelly? That's, you know, that's, that's the way they would phrase it. Joe, do you still beat Kelly? And so there's no way you could say, you know, you say yes, you're in trouble. If you say no, you're in trouble, right? It was one of those kind of, kind of questions. Um, and he doesn't beat Kelly just by, she just beats on him all the time, though. Are you watching, Kelly? I hope so. But they had this question that there was no way he's going to win on. And, and the question was about the imperial tax. Now, the imperial tax was really interesting. It was required of all people who were not Romans. If you were Roman, you didn't have to pay it. But if you were one of the guys who were under the rule of Rome, not a citizen Rome, but under the rule of Rome, you had to pay it. And, and it was used primarily to cover expenses in Rome. You might have heard of the phrase bread and circuses. Well, at the time, the emperors, to, in order to, have, to keep their political position and not have all kinds of people wanted to assassinate them, they need to keep the public happy. The way they kept their public happy was by entertainment, which is what the circuses were. And they weren't circuses with clowns. These were gladiator fights and chariot races and stuff like that. And they were expensive. So somebody had to pay for those. So the government sponsored these things that thousands and thousands of people would come to, entertainment. And bread was, they would give out free bread to residents of Rome. So as long as the government was feeding them and entertaining them, they were, they were happy. But that money had to come some, from someplace. And so they created the imperial tax that went to all the other nations all around the Mediterranean, from North Africa all the way to Spain, up into Britain, Anybody that was there that wasn't actually a Roman citizen had to kick in this imperial tax. And you can imagine they resented it like crazy. It was deeply unpopular. And if Jesus said, yes, go ahead and pay that, he would have been accused of being just a mere flunky of Rome. Okay? See, you're, on, you're in bed with the Romans. But to refuse to pay this was a dishonor, and to disobey the, the emperor would be a dishonor and disobedience to the emperor. And that could mean anything from a good beating to slavery or death. So they could get him either way, because they had the Herodians there who could report him to the Romans, and they had the Pharisees there who could report him to the regular people and go, see, this guy's in, on the side of Rome. So they could catch him both ways. So Jesus, scriptures say, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he asked him, whose image is this and whose inscriptions? Caesar, they replied. Now, this is a denarius, okay? Looks about the size of a dime. In fact, I'm going to pass this out. You guys can pass around. Just make sure I get it back, okay? That's a denarius. It's about the size of a dime, and, and, and it doesn't look like it's much value, but it's actually work, worth an entire working man's day salary. Okay, so imagine what you make for a day on your salary. That's, that's what that little coin is worth. It's made of silver. It was actually uh, printed at the expense of, of the emperor Tiberius. Tiberius was the, the main Caesar in charge, and he had him printed off in France, 
and, and, and basically he made money off of it. The money came straight to him. He's the one who paid for their printing, but he's also the one that got all the benefit from it. And so uh, it was representative of who he was. And it was forbidden. It was fun, kind of funny because that coin, when they presented it to him, they were in the temple. But interestingly enough, that coin was forbidden by the Jews to be in the temple. They kind of just snuck it in because they, they knew they were going to try to trap him. And the Jews said, you can't change. That's why they had money changers. You heard of the money changers in the temple? It was to take the Roman coins, which were forbidden, and trade them for the Jewish coins that you'd use to pay your Jewish your tax or your donations in the temple. Also, um, for Tiberius Caesar, whose image it is stamped on, I think we have a picture. Do we have a picture of this, Lucas? There it is. So you don't have to look at that little bitty thing that's going around. That's his image of it, and it had his image of it, and, and he saw it as an extension of his deity and his importance. And he actually made it a crime to take that coin, to carry that coin into the toilet or into a brothel. Okay? You could be punished by death by, taking that, by forgetting to empty your pockets when you went to the bathroom because that was, that was showing dishonor to the god Tiberius. He saw himself as a god. So it was, it was an extension of his deity that you'd get to hold in your, you were lucky enough to hold in your hand. And it was, it was the major, the coin was a major prop, instrument of propaganda and indoctrination to all the nations around the world with all their different gods and stuff. Hey, you've got to recognize the head of the Roman government, the guy that, that owns everything and runs everything, is actually a god. And we know that from numerous historical things, but actually this coin actually represents that because on the front of the coin, Tiberius is crowned with laurels of victory and deity. They didn't put crowns on like, like kings later on did, like gold crowns. The laurel, the leaf thing was, but that particular kind of leaf that they picture there meant two things, that he was, he was victorious over his enemies and then he was a god. Okay? And then... The words around it say this, Tiberius Caesar, worshipful son of the god Augustus, because Augustus was his dad, so he was literally saying, I am the son of a god, and therefore a god as well. Okay? On the back of the coin, it shows the Roman high priestess, and she's also the god, who's also the goddess of peace. So you see, by holding this, you're getting a political message about who your emperor is. Right? And notice the great irony in this. I find this personally really interesting. Show me a coin. They pull out that little taber that little little denarius, and they hold it up to him. And it's got a, a guy on it, okay, who's claiming to be the son of God, who's claiming to be the high priest, who's who's claiming that he's the prince of peace. And he's just a poser because the real son of God, the real pin of prince of peace, the real king, who, had, by the way, the crowd had just called out, hail to the king of the Jews, the real king of everything is looking at this guy's little fake attempt to make himself important as he's holding it in his hands. And that's why I think why his response is really classic. And when you read this in Scripture, we can't be sure of how Jesus, the tone, the attitude that came with it. We just sort of read it flat oftentimes in church. But I can just imagine that Jesus with a dismissive attitude like that, like really, like this, this guy is this, huh? Said, so why don't you just give back to Caesar what's Caesar's? In other words, he thinks that's so important, just give it back to him. Hand that right back to him. His self-importance, his grandeur, his, his imagination that he's a god. Because that real god was the one sitting there that they were trying to trap. And then he turns around and he says, now here's what you really need to think about. Give the phony guy the phony stuff. But you... You give to God what belongs to God. 
That is seditious. What belongs to God? What is it that belongs to God? Well, clearly he created everything. Clearly you aren't taking anything with you. When I used to take kids to Tijuana um, last week, uh, when, when Tony shared about Tijuana, excuse me, this, this last Sunday when Tony shared about Tijuana, brought the kids here, some of you were at that meeting. Um, when I used to run those trips, one of the interesting things, we'd go with Vaughn, and we'd go to where the Tijuana dump was. And the Tijuana dump was on a hill overlooking San Diego. You could see all the big mansions and hotels way off in the distance in Coronado. But the dump was on one side, and there was a road, and on the other side, there was the worst-looking cemetery I'd ever seen in the world. It was, it was just made of wood s sticks and scraps of the people that worked in the dump that perished there, that their homes were just in cardboard shacks and tar paper shacks all ringing the dump. And they'd work in the dump, and they'd die in the dump. And I remember we'd get the kids together and say, point to the trash tr trucks dumping all their stuff and say, that is the end of all your stuff. That's the end of all your stuff. The stuff you value, the stuff you think important, the stuff you work all day to earn and buy, that's where eventually it ends up. And then turn over here, and that's where you end up. You take nothing with you. And we all know that intellectually. We all get that. We get that we're not here because we're special, but we are given this as a gift that God created everything in it. We're not owners, but we're stewards and caretakers of what we've been given. And, and this is where it gets real seditious, because if you really believe that, if you're willing to, willing to take that understanding and say, not only does he own it, but he owns me. Because the Bible says you and I were bought with a price. You are not your own. If he really does own you, and he does own everything about you and everything you have and all the talents and gifts and skills and all the opportunities are all designed by him. They all belong to him. How might that change the way we live? How might that change the way we think about things? Instead of collecting things and trying to hold them for ourselves, might it not open our arms? I was thinking about this a lot and Imagine somebody saying, okay, I'm going to put a cap on my standard of living. I'm going to just decide that I'm, only, I'm going to put a cap. I'm, I'm, only going to, I'm not going to have any car that costs over X amount of dollars. And I'm not, not going to live in a house that costs more than this. And if I were to win that lottery ticket that they were, everybody was desperately trying to win, I'm going to give it all away except for this much. Okay. Imagine uh, if we decided we're going to have a cap on our living. Who would ever do that? In order that, not so that I can have demonstrate self-control or show how virtuous I am, but simply so that because God's providing me with enough to do what I need to do, and now I can take the rest of it and give it back to him for what he would want to have done with it. Imagine somebody who had the guts to do that, how hard it would be to do that, and, and how against the American dream this is. Just get more and bigger and better in your own jets. And imagine a business owner who God gave him the talent and skill to build a business, and he goes, you know, that talent and skill to build that business isn't mine. It actually belongs to God, and so I'm going to give him my business. Like, literally, give him my business. Who does that sort of thing? And if you did that sort of thing, how might that change the whole business world that you were living in? Well, I, I stumbled upon a guy that actually did those things. And I watched, I watched this little seven-minute video, and I go, you know what? I'm going to show that to you guys. This is a business owner who decided very intentionally to put a cap on his income and to give his business literally to God. And I'm not showing this to you as a formula, okay? So if you own a business, this is not a formula. But I'm showing this so that it might spark us to have these kind of conversations first with ourselves and those around us. How can we better use what isn't really ours in the first place? Our time, our energy, our money, our opportunities, our businesses, our stuff. 
How can we better use that? How can we answer Jesus' question to give to God what's God? Or fulfill his statement, to give to God what's God? How can we do that? And so I'm showing this as inspiration so that those conversations come up in whatever area of life you have the ability to control. That maybe God wants to stretch us out a little more than we thought this morning. Let's watch this video. It's a great joy to be with you and to be able to share the story of um, what an extraordinary God can do with, with ordinary people. Um, a story starts not far from here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I came to Christ at a young life camp uh, just west of here when I heard the gospel and I heard that Christ had died for me and that uh, I could now be uh, reconciled with God. And uh, so I entered into a relationship with Christ, went off to college and uh, grew a lot in my faith during my time in college. As I was getting out of school, some friends of mine were saying, go to seminary, go, in, go into full-time Christian work, do something significant with your life. And as I prayed about that, I just felt that God was telling me that um, all of us who are followers of Jesus are in full-time ministry and we all need to be doing something significant with our life and that, that God had gifted me more in the area of business and engineering than he had in the area of preaching or teaching. And so, so my path, I felt, was in the area of business. Um, because it was, and I came back and joined our small family business in Memphis, um, but I learned in college to study scripture and I decided to study through the Bible to see what it said about money and wealth and, and business. And uh, it said a lot thousands of verses and I'm an engineer so I'm cataloging these verses and and uh, but came away from that um, study that two-year study with um, a couple of major takeaways and the first was the whole concept of stewardship that everything that I have everything that I am has come from God and still belongs to God and I'm a steward and uh, I need to figure out what God wants me to do with his stuff um, and the second one was a fear of wealth a fear of the negative impacts of wealth. As I saw verse after verse after verse, and I don't have time to go through them, but there were dozens of verses, and, and many of them that Jesus spoke, that made me feel that wealth could really be a dangerous thing and that business success could easily lead to a detriment, you know, have a detriment to my spiritual life, and so that we needed to be uh, careful. Um, a couple years after I got out of school, my parents, I was working for my parents, and they decided that they were going to leave the company and get on a sailboat and sail around the world. And they did for most of the next, just the two of them, off they went for most of the next seven years. So my brother and I started a business. But before we started it, because of these scriptures that God had given us, we decided to put some safeguards in our life. And the first safeguard was that we said, um, this company belongs to God. Like everything else we have, this company is God's company. And then secondly, to avoid um, some of the pitfalls of wealth, we decided to put a safeguard in that would keep us from getting wealthy. And we put in a lifestyle cap, a lifestyle finish line. And we committed to that. Uh, we committed to each other and committed to God that this is our, our capped lifestyle. And, uh, and then we also built some accountability into our life by telling a few other people in our company about what our commitment was. And uh, this was in 1986. And the company was a very small company with about 10 employees in Memphis. But I can't tell you how, how thankful we are to God that he impressed those things on us at that point in our life because it set us on a trajectory that has been a great adventure. Um, we, um, we started our, our little business and uh, we made a little bit of money and the first year we were able to take some of that money and send it out to ministry. And we, uh, one, of the, one of the other commitments that we made is that we were going to do our giving as a group. And so at first it was six of us that got together in the company and prayed and said, God, what do you want us to do with your money? And we sent it out. And the next year there was more, and the next year there was more. And uh, we've just been on this amazing ride as God has grown our company about 20% a year for the last 30 years. And uh, so a company that was a little small local company in Memphis uh, now has over a thousand employees around the country. And we do, what we do for a living is we pick up and move heavy stuff. So we would mostly work in power plants and uh, oil refineries and we like smokestacks and we also put up wind turbines and um, we pick up and move heavy things. Um, but God has allowed this, this um, secular construction business um, to be a, a, a 
a vehicle for creating wealth that can be used to fund the kingdom. And he has allowed us to be part of the lives of brothers and sisters around the world who are more godly than we are, more committed than we are, but he, somehow he allows us to be a small part of what they're doing because of the, work, the money that we're generating. You know, as we continued in, in our company, um, as it continued to grow, it, it created a problem in that the company became worth a lot of money. We're a, we're a, a capital intensive business and uh, the company became worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And as far as we were concerned, God owned it all. As far as the IRS was concerned, my brother and I each owned half. And, and, and if, if something had happened to one of us, it could have been a, you know, a huge problem, uh, all this whole estate tax stuff. And, and so we were started going through that process of figuring out how to do that, and we realized that it was expensive and cumbersome. And, uh, and so we uh, went through the process of figuring out how to give away our business. And, uh, and we didn't know how to do it, and our advisors told us that that was a very bad idea. And uh, we finally connected with the folks at the National Christian Foundation, and they, very, they didn't think that it was a crazy idea. And they helped us figure out how to do it. And uh, over the course of a couple years, we figured out how to take our money, our company, and uh, irrevocably put it into a charitable trust. And uh, at first it was 99%, and then just recently the last 1%. So we are no longer the owners of our company. Uh, we continue to operate the company. We continue to actually have the voting rights. We're the trustee of the voting shares of our company. So we can continue to operate it for years and years to come. We can transfer it to, an, an, to a leadership team or another generation without any of the cost of doing that, but also without the danger of doing it. Because we, as, as I studied scripture, I really felt that, that um, there was a great danger in wealth but also a great opportunity. And so we have blunted the, the danger without blunting the opportunity. And um, so our children could become, uh, could take up the stewardship of the company without taking up the ownership. Um, we don't know what path that, you know, we, that's, we're still early in that stage and we don't know where that path is gonna come. But um, the, uh, I would say that the lifestyle that we have led has not been some Mother Teresa sacrificial lifestyle. But it has been one where we have um, had to do without a, some stuff, some toys. Um, but we haven't had to do without any of the good stuff. Radical, huh? Radical. That guy's rock star in my eyes. So I would just ask you to consider this. Consider being somebody who's part of the quiet sedition of the Christian faith. And it may not have to do with business. It might be, well, how about this? That, you, that you're going to ensure that you have a Christ-centered marriage and Christ-centered families and whose values are determined by God, not by culture. Or that you embrace your role that God's given you as a husband or wife or a man or a woman uh, or, or father and mother. Or you make it your primary mission life by word and by deed to proclaim the transforming power of Christ. That's why you get up in the morning, to look for an opportunity to live it out, to speak it, the transforming of power of Christ, and that we rethink our habits, our values, our standards, and bring them into the line of what it would be for the one who actually owns us, for the king who actually owns us, for the one that actually has claims on our life. Because when Jesus said, give to God what's God, I think all of us know that that's a heavy weight on us. Because we, are, we do belong to him. And many times we act as if we just belong to ourselves. And God wants to move in and, re and create that place in us where he actually is our owner and lives his life in us, through us, by our words, deeds, our businesses, our, our family life, our decisions. We let God be our owner this morning because he deserves it. Let's say a word of prayer. Father, I just thank you for the fact that you bought us, the price you paid on that cross, not just wiped away as our sins, but, but gave you ownership of us. May we go to you as, as one who owns us and check in with you and say, how should I then live? How should I think about this? What should I do with this? And learn and hear from you. Because in the end, God, we know that you want us to flourish and your kingdom to flourish. In Jesus' name, amen.